on Monday, and before we wrote our unit test on dynamics, we started a new unit on uniform circular motion. We defined uniform circular motion as motion of an object that was going in a circle, but at a constant speed. That's the whole uniform thing, right? Constant speed. There are clearly situations where objects are going in circles when they're not moving at a constant speed, but we're not going to analyze those objects. Everything we do will involve the object going at a constant speed, or at least approximately a constant speed. Now, we defined a couple of terms so that we could analyze those objects that were in uniform circular motion. The first term was frequency. Who remembers what we defined frequency as? More or less, at least what we defined frequency as. I don't care if you give me the exact definition or not. Miles, you remember that? Ben, you got that frequency? Yeah, it's the frequency at which something happens is how many times something happens, usually per second, although it could be per minute or per hour or per day, um, the number of cycles per unit time. And because the definition, the number of cycles per unit time, leads us to an equation, we can write frequency as lowercase f, right? Not a big F, because that would be, uh, what would that be? Big F would be force, right? And, and frequency and force are two completely different things. Uh, frequency is lowercase f. We can write that equation as the number of cycles per unit time. Now, what are typically the units that we associate with frequency? There can be a lot of different units, just like there can be for speed, right? But typically, at least the standard units for frequency are going to be what? William, what, what are the standard units for frequency? Hertz. We could say cycles per second. We could even say one over seconds, because sometimes you don't even write the word cycles there, just one over seconds. Uh, but that boils down to, as William said, hertz. Okay, one cycle per second, one event per second is equal to one hertz. All right, good. Period, on the other hand, is the inverse of the frequency. If frequency is the number of cycles per unit time, it's how many events take place in a certain amount of time. Period would be how much time it takes for one event to take place, how much time for one cycle. The time for one cycle. We're going to say period is it's symbol for period. Cameron, what's the symbol for period? It's T, but is it lowercase or big, big T? It's an uppercase T, a big T. Lowercase T is time, period is a time, but big T, period, is a specific time. It's the time for one cycle specifically, whereas little t can be any time you want, right? It can be the time that it takes you to walk to your locker. Or it can be the time that it takes a car to travel 500 kilometers. Or it can be the time that it takes light to travel from the light bulb to your eyes. Okay? It can be anything, right? Anytime. Big T is a time specifically for one complete cycle. So we're going to take our definition for period, turn it into an equation. If period is a time for one cycle, then it's going to be the time over the number of cycles. And the units for that one, of course, I won't even ask you, are going to be seconds, usually at least. The standard units are going to be seconds. What's the relationship between period and frequency? Kind of talked about it here already, but looking on the board, you should be able to see it. David, what's the relationship between period and frequency? Yeah, there's a relationship. We can find one from the other. Well, what's the relationship between period and frequency, remember? Oh, you weren't here, I don't think, when we did this, were you? Okay, okay. I guess it was the next day you missed, I think. Sonia? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm looking for right there. They're the inverse of one another. So if period is time over cycles and frequency is cycles over time, then period must be 1 over the frequency. And that's the equation, the only one for period that appears on our data sheet. T is equal to 1 over F. All right? Well, then we talked about speed, the speed of the object as it's in uniform circular motion. Uniform circular motion means it's going at a constant speed. But, of course, we know the distance around the circle once. Reese, what's the distance around the circle one time? 
What do we call it? The circumference, good. And what's the equation for circumference? Yeah, we can say pi times d or 2 times pi times r. Stefan, if we're going to use the distance around the circle once for d, then we're going to use the time around the circle once for t. What's the, uh, what's the variable that is the time around the circle one time? Good, it's uppercase t or the period. So we can say that an object moving in uniform circular motion is moving at a speed of 2 times pi times the radius of the circle divided by the period. Of course, that's going to be in meters per second. It's the two squared off equations that appear on your data sheet, but understand that you may sometime need to use one of these equations as well, even though it's not on your data sheet. Just remember the definitions, and you should be good. We also talked about, left off with on, on uh, Monday before our unit test, talked about uh, this, these two new terms, centripetal acceleration and centripetal force. Who remembers what centripetal means? The word centripetal means. Okay. Or, uh, Diana? It's center seeking, yeah, towards the center. So a centripetal acceleration is an acceleration that's directed toward the center of a circle. Centripetal force is a force that's directed toward the center of the circle. Let's go back to my uh, example that I like to give you guys. Swinging the keys, swinging the keys around my head. Okay, as I swing the keys around my head, they accelerate. How can they accelerate when they're going at a constant speed? They're changing direction. And acceleration is based on velocity, not on speed. Velocity is a vector, so if the direction changes, the velocity changes. Therefore, there's an acceleration. We know that acceleration is directed toward the center of the circle, although it's kind of hard to see why. We start talking about force, centripetal force. Well, what causes it? It's my hand. Where is my hand? It's in the center of the circle pulling inwards. So the centripetal force is pulling inward toward the center. The centripetal acceleration must therefore be pointing inward toward the center of the circle as well. Centripetal acceleration, acceleration toward the center, centripetal force, a uh, force toward the center. Finally, the acceleration can be found by this new equation v squared over r, which is on your data sheet. And the force can be found by this equation, which is also in your data sheet. Force, by the way, is m times a. Centripetal so force would be m times this a, the a that we just found. So m times v squared over r. I think it was somebody in the other class on Monday that, that asked me this question. Um, do I mean m times v squared over r? Or do I mean m times v squared over r? Which way should I do it on my calculator? This times the value we get for this and this, or this times this divided by this. It doesn't matter. It's the same thing. M times V squared over R is exactly the same thing as saying MV squared over R. So whatever way makes you feel good is the way that you should do it. All right, we left you with a couple of a couple questions on page 255 that I'd like to take a look at now. Let's have a look at number three. It says a helicopter blade has a diameter of 14 meters and it's in triple acceleration of 25, 27. What's the period of the helicopter blade? Um, first thing is, is this. This is diameter. We want radius, right? Radius is 7 meters, not 14 meters. Radius is 7 meters. The centripetal acceleration is 2527.0 meters per second squared. Now, we want to find the period. That's going to be big T, right? What do you want to start? What do you want to start with this? I don't care if you can give me the answer to this question or if you can even tell me how to get to the answer to the question. I just want to know where we start. We've talked about that a lot lately, right? Everybody has a place to start. Everybody has a place to start. Every question. Where's somewhere that we can start this? What do we know about it? Hey, what do we know about it? What's a valid equation? Something. 
about this? Where's somewhere to start with this, Emma? Okay, good. There's a start. Acceleration is equal to V squared over R. Now, we've got the acceleration, but it's still a valid equation, right? All right, so where are we going to go with this, Emma? Good. So it's not the velocity, but the speed. Yeah. So let's solve for speed. Uh, v squared becomes A times R, and then V becomes the square root of A times R. That's not what I'm looking for. That's okay. Okay. Nobody else had their hand up. Nobody else knew what to do. Emma's telling me I can find V. Let's get V. It's something. Maybe it leads me to where I'm going. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe, maybe Emma just wasted her time in solving for V. But it's correct. It's not wrong. So even if it is not, even if it doesn't lead me to an answer, it's okay. V is equal to the square root of A times R, which is 2527 times 7.0 meters. What is the square root of 2527 times 7? Thank you, Nick. We get 133 meters per second. So a football field, keep in mind, a football field is about 100 meters long, give or take a little bit, right? It's 110 yards long, um, 100 meters-ish long. Um, the, the, the end of a blade of a helicopter would go one and then a third of a football field again in one second. So it's traveling pretty fast, right? It's got to be traveling pretty fast to keep that helicopter up in the air. That seems like a reasonable speed. All right, what next? We got a speed. Is that going to be helpful to me, or is that just uh, oh, I could get it, so I got it, but it doesn't doesn't really help. Sounds like an idea. Now you got an idea here. V is equal to two pi times r over t. All right, that's a valid equation. Let's uh, rearrange that to solve for period. T goes up, v goes down. I think that's going to work. 2 times pi times 7 over 133. And when we do that, I think we get the answer in the book, 0 0.331 seconds. Three digits, because that's three digits. That's five digits. But the final answer has to be rounded to three digits. So this helicopter blade takes one-third of a second to go all the way around one time. That's why you can't see the blade moving, really, right? I mean, you can see it moving, but you can't distinguish its position at any given time because it's traveling so fast and goes around in one complete circle so quickly in one-third of a second. All right, let's take a look at another question. This one says, determine the magnitude of the centripetal force exerted by the rim of a dragster's wheel on a 45-kilogram tire. The tire is a radius of 0 0.480 meters, and it's going at a speed of 30 meters per second. So it's not a very fast dragster going at 30 meters per second. And I can go faster than that in my Dodge Caravan, for heaven's sake. Faster than 30 meters per second. Um... It's a centripetal force problem, right? Okay, so we know we're going to use that, end up using that equation. Let's write down some givens here first, though. Uh, 45.0 kilograms. Uh, the radius is 0 0.480 meters. And the speed is 30.0 meters per second. We want to find the force. This is actually a pretty straightforward question. We're going to say Fc is equal to m times a, or m times v squared over r. 45 times 30 squared, although sometimes you get a question where you're not going to be given the speed. You might be given the radius and the period, and you get a fine speed using 2 pi r over t to plug into here. This time they give you a break and tell you what it is. Let's calculate this together on our calculator up here. Say 45 times 30 squared divided by 0.48. We end up getting 
8.4, three digits, 8.4, four times 10 to the four. It's a pretty big force, right? 8.44 times 10 to the 4 newtons. Designing a tire is not just as simple as saying, ah, oh, let's mold some rubber together, mold some rubber together, put it on, and pump it full of air. Okay, when a car is going at 30 meters per second, it, ex it experiences a force, a centripetal force, of 8.4 times 10 to the 4 newtons. How many people... How many people uh, have a car here, not drive a car, but have their own car. Okay, you ever bought tires for your car? Yes? Who's bought tires for their car? Okay, when you go and buy tires for your car, um, depends upon the kind of car you have. Obviously, the size of the tires has to be different, the width of the tires, the radius, uh, and so on. But tires are also rated for different speeds. So you want to make sure that when you're buying your tires, you're buying a tire that is rated for the speed you plan on traveling, which should hopefully at least be the speed limit. Some tires are rated for higher speeds than others. Why? Because you can see here, guys, the faster you go here, the bigger the centripetal force required to hold this tire together. And it's, and it's exponential. So if you go faster, if you double your speed, let's say from 100 kilometers per hour to 200 kilometers per hour, it doesn't increase the centripetal force by a factor of two. It increases it by a factor of four because it's V squared. So you can see that it's important to have a tire that's designed to be strong enough to hold the centripetal force that's required at the speed you plan on traveling. All right, let's take a look at those two questions, please, at your desks. I'll take a walk around. You can let me know if you're having trouble with them. Let's have a look at question number two on this one as well. It says a 0 0.021 kilogram pebble was stuck in the treads of a dirt bike's wheel. The radius of the wheel is 23 centimeters. I told you guys, listen, we don't want to write down givens right away. We want to see bigger picture first. But when you see things like centimeters that you're going to have to convert, it might be a good idea to at least draw attention to that so that you don't forget to do it later on. So I was walking around. There was a couple of people that I caught um, using um, centimeters as opposed to meters. We have to convert to meters always. Okay, so Pebble experiences this force. What's the speed of the wheel? Um, so it, it is a centripetal force problem. We know it's going to be an mv squared over r problem. Now it's time probably to write down the givens now that we, we, we know what's going on in the question here. My mass is 0 0.0021 kgs. My radius is 0 0.230 meters. Be careful, sometimes they give me the diameter, right? If they give me a diameter, I want to divide that by two. My centripetal force is 0 0.660. And I want to find the speed. Well, I know that centripetal force is mv squared over R, I'm going to solve for V. That's kind of tricky. Take the R up by multiplying. F times R equals MV squared. Take the M down by dividing. And then you're going to square root that. So V becomes equal to the square root of F times R over M. Um, so what is that? Uh, 0 0.660 times 0 0.23 divided by the mass of 0 0.0021 and the speed, I assume, works out to be 8.5. So is that okay? Or do you want to go through the math there? Okay. So explain this one for me, guys. Why is the centripetal force on this one only 0.66? Why is it so small? We're talking about that last question, that example we did, where the centripetal force was really, really big. Why is it so small here? Yeah, Rosie? Yeah, a couple of things. We're talking about a pebble in a dirt bike's wheel. Okay, We're talking about a bike, as you said, that was going at a pretty slow speed, 8.5 meters per second rather than 30. Okay? 
F is equal to M V squared over R. If you go from 8.5 to 30, okay, that's a big difference in speed, but it's an even bigger difference in force because it's M V squared over R. It has an exponential effect as speed goes up on the value of the force. All right? Got another one for you that I want to do, a little bit harder. This one says determine the maximum speed at which a 1,500 kilogram car can round a curve that is a radius of 40 meters if the coefficient of static friction between the tires and the road is 0.6. Static friction means not moving, doesn't it? Yeah. Let's think of it this way. Static friction means not sliding. So when you're going around a turn on a, in your car, you don't want to be sliding, right? So it is static friction that keeps that wheel from sliding on the road. So it, we are dealing with static friction here. But we're also dealing with centripetal force here. Let's, let's think of it this way. As my keys swing around my head, there is a centripetal force acting on them that's caused by my hand. As the Earth goes around the sun, there's a centripetal force acting on the Earth caused by gravity. As the electron goes around the nucleus of an atom, there's a centripetal force caused by an electric force. As this car goes around a turn, there is a centripetal force. What's it caused by? Anyone? What allows this car to not slide off the road here? Stephanie, you think you know that one? Friction. Good. So what we're going to do in this is set the centripetal force equal to the friction force. Now let's write down some givens. Okay, we figured out what's going on. We didn't even necessarily have to write that down first before we wrote down the givens, but we do want to give it that thought first. We have a mass of 1,500 kilograms. We have a radius of 40 meters. And we have a coefficient of static friction of 0 0.60. We want to know the maximum speed. In other words, you go faster than this, the centripetal force, the frictional force can't hold you. Okay, you're moving too fast and you end up sliding off the road. Intuitively, you know that, right? If you, especially if you drive a car, you know intuitively that if you end up going too fast, you're not going to make the turn. Okay, I told you guys the story a couple times of when I was 16 years old driving my delivery van and sliding off the road when I hit a patch of ice. If I had been going slower, it would have worked, right? I wouldn't have slid off the road and hit the guardrail. Um, centripetal force is mv squared over r. Uh, friction force is mu times the normal force. Assuming this road is flat and not angled, assuming it's flat, then what's the normal force equal to? So, do you know what the normal force is equal to if it's a flat road? I'm sorry? Zero? No. No. Um, Riley, what's what's the uh, normal force equal to? Uh, what's where does that come from? Good. It's equal to gravity, right? Gravity pulls down. Normal force acts up. If it's an angled road, all bets are off, then, right? But if it's a flat road like this, then it's equal to m times g. Masses cancel here. What does that tell me? Interesting tells me it doesn't matter what the mass of my car is. I'm going to go around the turn at a certain speed. What matters is the rubber between the road and the, and the, and the car. Okay. Your car may be able to go around a little bit faster because of the rubber in your tires, but not because of the mass of your car. Okay, let's solve for V here. Uh, v becomes mu g r, r goes up by multiplying, and then we got to square root that. So it becomes 0 0.60 times 9.81 times 40 meters. And what do we got that phrase? Do you have that one? 15 meters per second? Should be three, di no, two digits, right? Two digits. So it is 15 meters per second. 
So remember, maximum force of static friction allows me to go around up to that speed. If I'm going slower than that, then, hey, that works, because friction doesn't have to be that high. Friction doesn't have to be the maximum value. It can be lower. It only is what it needs to be, static friction, that is. But I can't go faster, because that maximum force of static friction would be exceeded if I go faster, which means I slide off the road in a straight line, right? All right, have a look at these three questions, please, on page 259. All right, then let's have a look at question number three. It says a 600 gram, this is the only thing that I'm, like I sometimes circle things right before, before I'm finished reading the question, but otherwise I want to read the question, the whole question first and see what's going on here. A 600 gram toy radio control car uh, can make a turn at a speed of three meters per second on the kitchen floor with a coefficient of friction is 0 0.90. What's the radius of its turn? Well, we know if this thing is going around in a circle, we know it experiences a centripetal force, and we know that centripetal force is caused by friction. So this is going to be a problem like we did on our example, right? Centripetal force equals the friction force. Let's write down some givens here. My mass is 0 0.600 kilograms convert that kilograms to kilograms. The speed of the car is three meters per second. The coefficient of friction, 0 0.90, and we want to find the radius. Let's set FC equal to FF. You know that we talk about centripetal force, and, and we talk about it a lot in this unit, but it's not really a force on its own. It's not a fundamental force. It's always caused by something else. In a sense, what we're doing here, in a sense, what we're doing with centripetal force, this is kind of renaming something. Friction causes this car to go around in a circle, and friction happens to be pointing toward the center of the circle. We're just going to call that force of friction the centripetal force. Or the Earth going around the sun, it's, it's gravity that causes it to go around in a circle. We're just going to call that force of gravity the centripetal force. So in this case, it's really friction that we're dealing with. We're just going to call it centripetal force and apply this new equation that we just learned to do it. mv squared over r equals mu times the normal force, or mu times m times g. Good question. Is the centripetal force always going to be the same as the force of friction? No. Um, but in a context like this, yes. Um, now, as I'm swinging the keys around my head like I've done a bunch of times demonstrating centripetal force and acceleration to you, it's not friction that's keeping those keys going around the circle. So in that case, the centripetal force would be equal to the tension force. Okay, if it's the Earth going around the sun, then the centripetal force would be equal to gravity. If it's the electron going around the nucleus, the centripetal force would be equal to the electric force. Okay. Um, when a car is going around a turn, you, you got to ask yourself what's causing it to go around the turn. It's not centripetal force that's causing it to go around in a circle. In this case, it's friction. But if it's going around in a circle, we can call that centripetal force. So whenever it's friction that's causing it, yes, okay, centripetal force would be equal to friction. But if it's something else causing it, then no, friction, uh, centripetal force would be equal to something else. All right, masks cancel again. doesn't matter how heavy the car is. Um, we're solving for R here. R goes up by multiplying. It becomes equal to mu times G times R. Mu G goes down by dividing. It becomes V squared over mu G. So it becomes uh, 3 squared divided by 0 0.90 times 9.81. Mass of the car is canceled, so regardless of how heavy, I mean, try it sometime, right? Seriously. You got a remote control car, a toy car, go around a turn in your kitchen, and then put some mass on top of it. See if it makes a difference. It doesn't. The mass cancels, right? It's not going to make any difference in how fast it can go before it spins out. Uh, works out to be about a meter there. Good. All right, just a little bit more to do here today. And then we'll wrap it up. Centrifugal force. You ever heard of that term? Centripetal force, centripetal force, is that center-seeking force 
that pulls an object or pushes an object toward the center of a circle. It doesn't mean the object goes inward toward the center. Just because there's a force inward doesn't mean it goes inward. It ends up going in a circle, right? The inward force that causes it to go in a circle. Centrifugal means not center seeking, but rather center fleeing. It's a center fleeing force. In other words, it's the force. I'm going to put that in quotation marks and you'll see why in a minute. It's the force that pushes an object. outward, away from the center of a circle. And there's a couple of things that are conspicuously enclosed within um, some uh, brackets here, or, or some uh, quotation marks here centrifugal force and force. Why? When I define centripetal force, I didn't put those in quotation marks. Why centrifugal? I'll tell you why. Even though we've all experienced centrifugal force, you're driving around in a car and you get you're going in a turn and you're going fast and you get pushed to the outer side the outer wall of the car, right? We've all experienced that centrifugal force. You're on a merry-go-round and you feel like you're being pushed out, right? You're on that, anybody ever, ever, ever been on the Gravitron ride? Or that, uh, I forget what it's called, at Callaway Park where it spins around and you get pinned up against the wall? You guys know what I'm talking about? We've all experienced this centrifugal force, but here's the funny thing about this force that we've all experienced. It doesn't exist. There's no such thing as the centrifugal force force. This force that we've all experienced and that we all have felt doesn't exist. So how do we explain it? Is it just our imagination that pushes us to the outer wall of the Gravitron ride? No, not at all. We do end up going to the, to the outside wall. We do end up getting pinned against it. But it's not centrifugal force pushing you in toward the center at all. I'm going to sit down in my chair here and show you something. I gave you this little uh, example in our last unit when we were talking about Newton's first law. It's relevant again because we're going to be talking about Newton's first law again in just a moment here. I'm sitting in my car, minding my own business, paying attention when I'm stopped at a stoplight. Not texting, because you don't text even when you're at a stoplight, right? None of you guys do that, right? Sitting there, and you get hit from behind. What happens? Well, your body ends up going forward. Your head goes, well, it doesn't really go backwards. It just kind of feels like it goes backwards, right? What does it feel like? What does it feel like as you're being pushed forward? It feels like you're being pushed back into your seat, right? Remember the first time I was ever on an airplane, I was 12 years old, first time I was ever on an airplane. And I was by myself, um, flying from Toronto to Halifax. And I remember the first time, um, a little bit nervous, excited but nervous. And I remember um, taxiing out, you know, you taxi out to the runway slow, and there's this lady next to me, I'm chatting with this lady, and, and uh, I remember turning onto the runway, and then the pilot guns it like they do. If you've ever flown on an airplane, you know, like you're going really slow, and then they're going at, you know, a couple hundred kilometers per hour a couple seconds later. Guns it really fast. What does it feel like? You're being pushed back into your seat, right? You know what I'm talking about? When you accelerate quickly forward, it makes you feel like you're being pushed back. Even in your car, if you accelerate quickly, you feel like you're being pushed back into your seat, right? Whenever you have an acceleration one way, it creates what we call a pseudo force the other way. In other words, a fake force the other way, a force that you feel but doesn't really exist the other way. We know we're not really being pushed back into our seat when we accelerate quickly in a car. We know 
that the car is accelerating that way and the seat is pushing on me forward. I feel like I'm being pushed back, but really I'm being pushed forward. Same thing happens here. When you're going around in a circle like this, you're on the outer wall of this gravitron ride. You've, you're being pushed inward toward the center of the circle by the wall. That's the direction of the centripetal force. But because you're being pushed inward, you feel like you're being pushed outward. Just like when I was sitting in my seat in my car and I accelerated forward, I felt like I was being pushed backwards. Does that make sense? Centrifugal non-existent force is really just the centripetal force the center seeking force combined with your inertia. You want to go in a straight line like this, but the wall pushes you inward instead of allowing you to go in a straight line. So you feel like you're being pushed outwards. What happens if you don't start at the outside of the circle? What happens if you're on the merry-go-round? You know, you have the merry-go-round with the four bars. You don't see merry-go-rounds very often anymore, actually. Yeah, but occasionally you do. Remember, in my elementary school, we had a merry-go-round. It took it out years ago. It's not there anymore, but um, we used to have a merry-go-round, and that was the thing that everybody wanted to play on was this merry-go-round. They took it out, as they took out almost every other merry-go-round, is because kids get hurt. We don't want to allow kids to get hurt anymore. We don't want to allow kids to experience the real world anymore. Okay. People get hurt in the real world. I don't see a problem with it, right? Just have fun. Every once in a while, someone breaks an arm. It happens. Okay. I never broke an arm. I was fine. You're going around this merry-go-round, you start right here, and sometimes you get people running around, holding onto the bars, spinning it around counterclockwise here, let's say. And sometimes they get it going so fast, you're standing right here, get it going so fast, you have a really difficult time holding on. You get thrown to the outside. All right, that's not you feeling like you're being pushed to the outside, right? That's you going to the outside. So how do we explain that? Well, as this thing goes around counterclockwise, you're not going in a circle. You're going in a straight line. But by the time, look, you're on this bar right here, bar number one. Okay? By the time you make it to the outside, where's bar number one? Bar number one's there. So you end up, you're going in a straight line. That's your inertia because there's nothing holding you, pushing you toward the center. But in the end, by the time you get to the outside, the bar that you were holding on to, is, it, it's caught up with you. Basically, it's catching up with you at every stage along the way, but you end up right there. So what does it feel like to you? It felt like you were being pushed to the outside of that, that circle, but really, you were just going in a straight line. Again, your inertia. And then when you get to the outside, that's when you fly off and break your arm. Got it? I'm going to have you work on a few questions for homework now. The ones that I want you to work on, guys, uh, we won't make you do all of these. Like 15 questions is a lot, right? How about 1 to 14? No, I, I won't even make you do uh, all the way up to 14, actually. I'm going to have you guys, I'm going to have you guys uh, work on questions 12, 13, and 14, 12, 13, and 14. Okay, they're the more challenging ones as the further we go, but I think you guys are ready for that. We did ones in class, and you guys seem to handle those well. So 12, 13, and 14 on page 268 for tomorrow.